Well, this is, this is my first time, I think, at SFHTML5. Thank you for having me. Uh, I think Peter already gave enough of an introduction, so why don't we just go ahead and get started. But, so we're going to talk about microformats in HTML5 today. However, I want to start by saying that everything I put in my slides, all the text, all the code, and all that, is Creative Commons licensed, which means that you're permitted to take the text or take the code and copy it, use it. The only thing that I ask for is attribution. So just as long as you mention it's you know, from Tontec or link to Tontec.com, that, that would be sufficient. Uh, I'd like to do that with my work and presentations so that to encourage a culture and spirit of reuse and uh, an, open, an open content. The second thing, as Peter mentioned, uh, we've got an Etherpad set up. So if you're, if you're online, if you manage to get online, uh, Vanessa had some passwords she was handing out for the Adobe guest uh, login. If you go to etherpad.mozilla.org slash microformats2, you should see something that looks roughly like, let's see, this. And this is for collaborative note taking, but it's also for Q&A. So if you come up with questions during the presentation, feel free to go ahead and add them to uh, the questions section there down at the bottom. If you want to just take notes, go ahead and take notes. And I've asked that everyone that contributes this agree to go ahead and put everything in the public domain according to CC0, which means that everyone can just copy and paste from this and reuse it as they wish. And that just makes it easier all around. If you do add notes or, or add questions, go ahead and add yourself and your URL, your Twitter, uh, to the Etherpad there in the contributors section. Awesome. And go ahead and type in your name here, or else someone else can type in your name for you. Anyway, that's enough of that. So that's the Etherpad. And I see we've got a bunch of folks on there. Awesome. Cool. OK. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, there's basically three basic areas I'm going to talk about. One is, where are we with microformats today? It's been uh, microformats.org launched in 2005. That's uh, like forever ago in web years, eight years ago. And it's been, uh, it's on lots of different sites. I'll talk about what's, what's actually succeeded, what's deployed. Second, I want to go over a couple of the challenges and lessons we've learned, because I think in the development of any web technology, um, it's important to see, well, what happens? Where do you get stuck? What do you need to change? How, how do these things iterate and improve? And third, I'm going to close with where are we today with best practices for publishing data on the web with Microformats 2 and HTML5, especially in combination. So where are we with Microformats today? Um, for a technology that's, that's, quote, eight years old, and I mean, it's been evolving ever since, uh, we're in a pretty good shape, actually. Turns out, according to the uh, to a crawl by the Web Data Commons, this is 2012, um, hasn't changed much, uh, Microformats are amount, account for about 70% of the structured data that's published on the web. And that's pretty impressive when you consider that there's a lot of different ways of doing it. I think this, uh, so basically everything in this dark orange area is all microformats. This big, um, this, this like light colored 20, 25% here is, um, claims to be RDFA, but it's also sort of like pseudo RDFA from uh, Facebook's open graph protocol, which is kind of like meta tags 2.0. Everyone remember meta tags, right? Anyone here using Facebook open graph OGP on their sites? I'm not, but I won't raise my hand. A few folks, I see about a half dozen. Okay, and then this like uh, much thinner slice next to it, that's all the microdata as well, which is one of the newer proposals uh, to come out to, to mark up data on the web. So that's where we are with microformats today. It's uh, pretty good. And I, I wanna come back to, I wanna talk about like two principles that I think accounts for why there's so much microformats deployed and why it continues to grow and get adoption. And that's simplicity and openness. And I think these are both very important because the web itself was built uh, with these two principles, right? One person, one man, came up with the basics of HTML, HTTP, and URLs. And that meant it had to be simple for any one person to do it, right? They're like building blocks. Um, plus, he did something that not many folks were doing at the time, is he published them uh, with an open license. So HTML, HTTP, and URL were all published with an open license. Uh, how many of you remember Gopher? OK, more people that are using the open graph protocol. I'm impressed. Um, that's pretty funny, actually. Uh, the Gopher code and license of protocols, all that, were not published openly, despite being developed at a university. And that was you know, characterized for one of the reasons why they didn't succeed. So one of the things we've done with uh, microformats is that since 2007, all the work done in microformats is all placed into the public domain um, with a license that's, that's CC0 or, or compatible. And that's really important. What this means is that anyone that wants to iterate on these standards propose changes, uh, incorporate them into a book that you might sell, or a presentation you might give, maybe a talk, um, can do so. And that's incredibly liberating. Uh, the WhatWG also 
with new standards uh, uses the CC0 license for them. And that's what I mean by openness. Like we've learned how to be very open with open standards development. Not everyone else is there yet. Uh, but we think that that's, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why Formats has succeeded. One such nice side effect is that there are now up to 19, there are 19 different translations of the Microformats wiki in, pro in progress. The most recent ones are Georgian, that's the country, not the state. I, I know sometimes it seems like it may seem like a different country, but, um, and Turkish. So it's pretty impressive that all these different uh, individuals from around the world, like come to the Microformats wiki, anyone can create an account, anyone can edit, and because it's all CC0, um, anyone can take the content, modify it, contribute it, knowing that whatever they contribute, they can always get back out, right? It's not like we're saying, oh, once you give it to us, you know, we own the copyright. I'm not gonna mention others, any other standards organizations by name, uh, like most of them. Uh, <laughs> so that's pretty cool. But really, like with any technology, with HTML5, or any web technology, you gotta be asking yourself, like we have limited time on our hands, we're trying to build stuff, we're trying to ship to customers, why microformats? Well, why work on anything at all? Like why worry about any particular technology at all? And I wanna hopefully go over a few reasons that will help you with deciding, you know, is it worth the investment of time it takes for me to learn microformats and use them? Um, the first is that, how many of you actually work on a website here? I'm guessing most of you, right? Like hopefully everybody, otherwise why are you here? <laughs> Just want to hear me talk or curious about HTML5, perhaps. Um, if you do, with microformats, it's really easy to add simple features like add, add your contact information, uh, download your contact information, and or download events. So every single website out there has some sort of about page, contact information for a company or a person. Um, that's an immediate benefit you can get by using microformats. Many companies have events that they sponsor, or maybe event sites do, like Meetup, um, and support the age calendar microformat where you can use that to add to your calendar. So that's like a really simple feature, works with many websites, so that's like one H card. Um, since 2009, uh, Google launched what's, what are called rich snippets in their search results, and this has been a big driver of microformats adoption, uh, and that is that if you add microformat support, and now Bing supports this and Yandex as well, uh, this is an H review, for example, you will see, uh, assuming they whitelist your site, um, you will see, hopefully, eventually, a, a better result for your site in search results, and what they found, lots of other people have corroborated this as well, is that users tend to click on rich SNP results more than just normal search results. So that's been a big driver of microformats adoption. Um, the third, and I think this is a really important one, and this crowd probably understands this better than most, is that it's really, if you build your site so that others can build on, on top of it, more people will use your site, more people will find your site, more people will wanna be dependent on your site, and so if, by enabling people to be to use your site as a building block, uh, you can do that. And you can do that with microformats in the following way. Microformats provide the quickest and fastest way to provide what I call a cheap, dry API. Who knows what dry stands for? Lots of folks here in the front row. Don't repeat yourself. Yes, excellent. So one of the things that microformats do, and a lot of HTML markup methods do this now, is that they encourage you to mark up the data on the page as it is, that's being published, that's visible, that if someone screws up, there's a good chance someone will see it and fix it, as opposed to parallel XML files or JSON files, right? Um, for example, RSS, right? How many of you publish RSS feeds or read RSS feeds? Okay, is that number any fewer since Google Reader shut down or anyone? No, okay. Um, when I was at Technorati, one of the things we found is that up to two thirds of RSS feeds, or I should say feeds in general, whether it's RSS or Atom, uh, had problems. Either they were out of date, or they were broken, or had other weird problems that the HTML pages didn't do. So we were indexing blogs at the time, and one of the big things we did was we said, well, RSS is so broken, we actually have to index the HTML. So we were indexing the HTML by like literally looking at one blog publishing platform at a time, what classes they use, huge pain, but we did it. The point is, if, you're, if your website's gonna have an API, if you just start with adding microformats to your HTML, it's so much less work than creating XML, and it turns out it's more reliable. Um, this isn't a hypothetical thing where if you build it, they will come. I mean, yes, it's true. If you build it, they will come. They will crawl you. There are plenty of other sites that are out there that are consuming microformats today. So, for example, readability. If you publish your periodic or episodic content, your articles with H entry markup, H atom markup, then readability will parse that accurately and incorporate it into their service. Similarly, with Spinner, and Foursquare as well for venue information. All right, these are just like a few big sites that are doing this. There's lots of smaller sites too. 
So that's pretty cool. You build your site, you support microformats, you're instantly plugged into these other sites, this ecosystem of publishing, publishers and consumers of web data. So, and lastly, this I think is one of the most important, which is that the microformats approach to adding data to HTML or letting the data become more visible is the simplest solution. It's the least code that you can do compared to other approaches. Okay, so which microformats? Now I've given you an explanation as to why. Over the years, there are about a dozen microformats that have survived, like the microformats process, the, the, the crucible of real-world implementation, real-world tests. And, that, and that's a really important test. It's like, well, which, what microformats actually matter? There's probably been like dozens, maybe even a hundred different proposals for different microformats, and you know, some have come, some have gone. Um, the ones that are, these are the ones that matter. I don't know if those of you in the back can read these, but all these slides are available online, and I will I'll put the URL in there as well. H. Atom for readability, um, numerous consumers. Uh, that's for periodic information. H. Card is the fundamental building block for people and organizations. So if any information on your website about people, like a social network, it makes sense to mark up their profiles with H. Card. Similarly, your about page, organizations, and such. Uh, there's lots of consumers of those. H calendar for events. And again, I'm only listening to, listening to microformats here that have seriously taken off, that have support from lots of different consumers, uh, mainstream and small extensions and browser extensions, Firefox, Chrome, et cetera. H media. This is for media uh, microformats. So if you're publishing pictures or video, this is one that we saw Google start consuming recently. It started showing up in the webmaster dashboard. We don't know what they're doing with it. But they are consuming it because if, you're, if you have your site set up with the Google Webmaster Dashboard, then they'll show you, oh, we found some H media. Okay, well, if you found some, they're parsing for it. We're not sure what they're doing with it. H product. Uh, this is used in lots of the search results. H recipe for publishing recipes. This was a funny one because it literally started as like a few hobbyists, a few foodies deciding, hey, we just want to publish our recipes on our blogs. And so let's come up with a format for doing that. So they did. They created H Recipe. And that was years ago. Um, turns out Food Network and a bunch of other sites out there started publishing their recipes with H Recipe. I'm not sure why, but maybe they just found it easy to do. Maybe they found that the class names were something they could use instead of making up their own. Fast forward to, you know, within the past few years, Google launches a recipe search product. And they launched this product only with supporting H, with, the, with parsing and, and publishing all the H recipe, uh, H recipes that are published out there. Now, that, they now support alternate uh, recipe formats as well, but H recipe is basically, because there were so many out there, that's what this entire product was built on that Google uh, supported. H resume. If you're at a company or starting a company, you're either looking for jobs or you're looking to hire people. So again, something that's incredibly practical and, and, and well deployed with even libraries that are out there that clients are using to consume it. H review. I talked about product reviews earlier. All the major search engines and uh, my Chrome formats extension on, on Chrome also supports that. H review aggregate. So if you have pages that show multiple reviews for the same product, um, this is one of the microformats that some of the folks from Google helped uh, edit and contribute and, uh, and, and push forward. Uh, finally, we come down to a few rel, rel values that are consumed by uh, various different services. And those, the ones that have really taken off are rel me which is used by Google. It's used by uh, the burgeoning RELME auth, indie auth web sign-in technique. So this is, this is so people can sign in with their own domain rather than necessarily like uh, username and password. It's kind of an iteration on the open ID idea. RHEL author, this is a big one. Uh, in, in search results, Google basically, and I think other search engines are working on this, uh, show potentially an image of the author. And they get that from your author page, which they find via RHEL author. And finally, rel license, it's in order to indicate the license the content of a page is licensed under, is also supported by the advanced search services of, uh, of most search companies. So that's where we are with microformats today. That's imminently practical right now. You can deploy that stuff. It becomes immediately useful to your site, to your users. Um, you get value at it right away. What are the challenges and lessons we've learned uh, over the past eight years? Well, first of all, this. Just because microformats have been around for eight years doesn't mean there haven't been other efforts. There have been. So there's been at least nine that I've counted alternative approaches um, over the past eight years to microformats, starting with structured blogging. Um, and in fact, I'll ask, how many here use structured blogging? Anyone here publish structured blogging? No, well, a couple folks. Okay, so you remember that. 
And then Google Base schemas came out in 2005 as well. Anyone here do use Google Base? A couple of folks. OK. Um, and that got shut down eventually. But Google switched from that about two years to the Google Data API and Elements. Did anyone here publish those? That's even fewer. OK. Like nobody, as far as I can tell. All right. Uh, finally, uh, in 2009, Yahoo and a few companies launched commentag.org. Anyone here use or remember common tag? Okay. One, one, maybe one finger raised back there, I said, remembers it. Well, as far as I can tell, that got published as a blog post and never went anywhere. So that also didn't really go. Finally, in 2009, same time that Google launched the rich snippets, they launched this uh, rdf.datavocabulary.org. Anyone here publish rdf.datavocabulary.org content? One person in the back, one sort of person here in the front. Anyone else? That's about it. Okay, a couple folks. Um, so this, this actually confirms a lot of what I'm seeing, which is that the memory for web technologies is about two years. Like if it's more than two years old, people have forgotten about it or don't even know it ever existed. Which if you think about it, it's kind of amazing that microformats are still used. Like shouldn't that be dead already? No. Okay. Um, 2010, Facebook launched an uh, open, open graph protocol called MetaTags. And this one, I'm guessing, I saw a few hands as it's raised earlier, about a dozen different hands. Um, has gotten more update because they showed immediate benefit to it. You add OGP, all of a sudden your previews show up differently in Facebook. The other thing that they did uh, is that they used the, uh, we call the Open Web Foundation uh, license agreement, which provides a very liberal and open license for in terms of copyright and patents. And that's actually pretty important for any kind of open technology. So the Open Graph Protocol is actually fairly open. You know, it's not quite as open as public domain, but they put a nice license on it that was openly developed, and, and that was uh, good of them to do. Finally, in 2011, um, Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo, in as much as Yahoo's search is separate from Microsoft now, uh, or not, launched schema.org. And I'm guessing, is there, are there folks here, since that was only two years ago, right? Using schema.org? Anyone publishing schema.org? One, two, three, four? OK. About twice as many, at least, as the, as the rdf.datavocabulary.org folks. And then 2012, last year, Twitter launched Twitter cards. Yet another way of doing meta tags. Is anyone supporting those on their websites? One, anybody else? No, nope. you guys, you support everything. All right, awesome. Um, and then also openmetadata.org. That was the most recent thing I saw. Does anyone support that, publishing that, or anybody here? No one. Okay, so no one on that one. All right, well. There's been a lot of different alternative approaches. Like I said, especially at Google, about every two years, um, they seem to kind of reinvent something about what they're doing. And they're kind of due, uh, but we'll see. We'll see, what they, we'll see what they iterate on. So what are the lessons we've learned with microformats? Well, one thing is that if people keep coming up with alternatives, clearly there's something we could be doing better. Uh, that's, that's an important lesson. But one really big one that we learned, well, classic microformats use class names like class equals summary, class equals description. And this worked great from a simplicity perspective, yet it had two major flaws. One is that uh, it would clash with people's existing sites or class names, like WordPress themes. And so then you'd have to either hack your CSS or redo your CSS or redo your class names. It was a kind of a pain. Now, those examples were sort of like the, the, the edge case or the minority, but they were enough that it, it just caused enough cases where people didn't pay attention to them. But the worst problem, worse than that, was that a site would be built by one person. They'd add microformats. Great, awesome. That person would move on to a different project. The designer would change. New designer comes along and be like, I need to redesign the site. Um, what are these extra class names doing in here? They're not using the CSS. So I'm just going to throw them out because less code is better, right? So a lot of sites we saw added microformats. They stayed for a while. Then in the redesign, they lost them. And we're trying to figure out why, what happened. Well, a new person just didn't know that they were microformats there at all. So one of the things we've done in microformats too, a little sneak preview here, is that we're using prefix class names. H dash, star P dash, U dash, DT dash, and E dash. Five different prefixes. So that when you see these class names, they actually do mean something different. you would be like, hey, this looks different. This looks like it's a part of something. Maybe I should look it up. And that gives us a, at least a chance that uh, microformats will survive a little bit better through different redesigns and such. And that's, that's better. Uh, the other thing that it did, the side effect of defining a set of prefix class names for microformats 2 was that we actually came up with generic parsing for all microformats 2 vocabularies, which is awesome because now we have a canonical mo JSON model, which is great because that means you can write a parser once that parses all of microformats 2, generates canonical J JSON, so that anyone that wants to consume the data of representation of a site can do so. 
That's incredibly powerful. So it's easier for the, it's easier for the publisher, just a few microformats classes, and it's easy for the consumer, canonical JSON to consume. All right, the second big lesson that we learned is that despite microformats being fairly micro, for a lot of people, they weren't micro enough, for especially in simple cases. So the simple cases, if you're just marking up a person's name or even just a few names, uh, you had to use two, two elements and two class names to do it, right? Um, even more if you've got more components to the name. And the amazing thing is that this is for simple microformats examples. If you wanted to use the alternatives to mark these up in HTML, like microdata or RDFA, I can't even show you what these would look like here because it takes up too much space. It's even more code to do so because microdata and RDFA each have a whole slew of different attributes. So you have to remember which one to use when to mark things up. And the attribute values are larger. Sometimes they're whole URLs, right? And this makes it even much more complicated. But that's okay. We wanted to make them even smaller. So what do we do? With microformats 2, we came up with a way to minimize very common cases. If all you're marking up is the name of something, the name of a product, a person, organization, an event, all you have to do is what uses one class name, just one class name. If you've already got a hyperlink to that thing, like a person, then you've already got an element for it. And again, just adding one class name will give you the name and the URL of the item that you're marking up automatically. You just mark up the, the name of the uh, microformat. Also with an image, tons of sites have hyperlinked images of products, of people, of organizations, et cetera. And instead of asking them to add lots more elements, lots more attributes, Again, one class name for that very common case gives you the URL, the photo, the name. And this was one of the top complaints that we had about microformats, and we think we've solved it with microformats too. So the question was, is it, can we assume that by convention, the image that's embedded in this hyperlink uh, is assumed to be part of the hyperlink and therefore parsed out accordingly? And the answer is yes. So we've got some very specific parsing rules that handle the specific cases. In this case, is it, the, is it the, is an image inside the hyperlink, right? Is it the only image? So we know, hey, this is a hyperlinked image. The whole thing is just one big image. Great. That means the image probably represents what's being hyperlinked. In all the cases we found, that's the case. It's, that's the intention. So we can take the source of the image as the photo of whatever object that you're marking up, the URL as the URL, and again, the alt text as the name. So potentially, we got three properties for free uh, with microformats, too. So this brings me to where we are. So I've given you a little bit of a sneak peek of microformats too, but I want to, I want to take it back to what, uh, what HTML5 even brings us in terms of new, uh, new abilities. The first is, how many of you publish HTML data tables? Okay, we've got about a half dozen. Excellent, so you know all about how table headers work and, ta and, and TDs and all that work. You can do amazing things with HTML data tables. In fact, I want to show you an example um, of an HTML data table that I did last year. Okay, it, this might not look like a table, but this is. This is, this is all, this, all this layout is done with CSS. These are all different columns in a table. And one of the ways that you can tell that that's true is when, you, when, when I publish this, within like a day or two, So it's one big table, like I said, 500 table rows. People all went to this conference. Uh, yeah, the one row of table headers and the rest all table cells. Very simple. The search results for that table actually showed up as a rich snippet. And as far as I can tell, this is completely undocumented in Google's uh, webmaster documentation. But what Google did is they found that there's 500, it says 500 plus items. Nowhere on that page did I say 500. Google figured that out by actually parsing the table rows and counting. Unofficial, okay, XOXO directory, et cetera, summary of the, of the table. And then they parsed out the table headers, name, location, website, Twitter. And they showed the first two rows of the table as a table, right? And that's kind of amazing. Like Google's parsing data tables and showing them as rich snippets. And that's, here's an example of rel author bit I was talking about earlier. Um, that's pretty cool. Nowhere is this documented. That's the key, right? If you just use semantic HTML5 as richly as you can, the search engines will crawl it, and 
if they can do something interesting with it in terms of presentation, they will. So it's just another re good reason to like always use proper HTML5 markup. You never know when they're going to make use of it. Yes, question. Okay, so the question was about two years ago, tables were totally out of vogue with designers. They still are out of vogue, to be clear. <laughs> tables for presentation, bad. Tables for data, good. Two very different types of tables. So if you're using tables for layout, you're probably doing all kinds of wrong things. Um, and your site probably looks very, very bad on mobile devices. Okay. You guys have probably already heard about responsive design. I'm not going to go into all that. Learn responsive design. It's good stuff. Um, but HTML data tables work great. And they get indexed properly. And as long as you use them correctly, like for data, not layout, uh, that's a good thing. OK. By the way, HTML data tables, they've been there since HTML4. So learn them. Use them. They're good. They still work in HTML5. HTML5 added two important elements for the representation of data on the web. And that's the time element and the data element. No, this, is, this has nothing to do with data star attributes, data dash attributes. This is the data element. And this is pretty cool because the time element lets you mark up dates and times in a structured way. You can say time. You can say what the date time is in, in the standard ISO format. And then you can actually put inside uh, the time element what the human readable text should be. Um, alternatively, you can also combine them with the microformats, what we call value class pattern, to combine like date and time values into one property. This is the DT start property we're using here that you might use for like an event. And these are two different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, they each have their advantages and disadvantages. In the first instance, you're, you've, you're basically having to commit a dry violation because you're saying, hey, I want to present a locale specific view of the date and time, but I need to pre present the machine readable version of the date time attribute. So you get the locale. In the second version, you're only presenting the date and the time once, and so there's a better chance it's going to be up to date. In fact, I, you know, first time I made this slide, I made a mistake. I made a typo and typed in 1515 for the t date time attribute here, but it's 1516 in line. I found it later, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to leave it in because this illustrates exactly the problem with the drive violation is that there's a very easy chance that you're going to forget something and maybe have it missed. Right? Um, maybe something like a linter could catch this, but then you just kind of have to parse arbitrary human readable dates and times. Wouldn't count on it. But time element, either way, buys us a lot of things. And you can do all kinds of cool stuff with the time element markup. You can mark up years, like the copyright right, of a page. You can mark up year months, like email lists or blog archives. Um, how, many, how many of you have a blog? I have a blog. OK, a few folks. You all should have a blog. It's all published. Self-publishing is good. Um, birth dates. So you can omit the year and just have the month and the day. You can also mark up durations and length and like longer lengths as well, whether it's seconds or minutes and seconds. HTML time element is very versatile. Okay, the second element, the data element, super cool. So we had this pattern uh, in microformats called the value class pattern, value title, that where you had to use one span to say, hey, this is an element. You had to use another span saying class equals value title, and then use a title attribute. Essentially, it was this giant hack to present a way to provide machine-readable information that's the equivalent of human-readable information when the two are just too different to reconcile. In this case, I picked a really simple example and showed you how we're able to use the data elements for latitude and longitude to represent the decimal latitude and also the decimal, I mean, the, the, the human-readable uh, latitude and then decimal longitude and then the human-readable, uh, more conventional, uh, longitude. So you do that with just class and value. I mean, the value is all you need with the, with the data element. The class gives you this for like a geo microformat. So you can do that whole thing there. And in fact, um, you can do this like this is like on Wikipedia today. You'll see visible the latitude, longitude, and in degrees, minutes, seconds. But they mark it up so that uh, you can get it out of get out of with microformats. I don't think Wikipedia is using a data element yet, but they could be, and this is what they should be doing if they do. Question. So right now, so the question was, are browsers doing anything with rendering um, like either the, the date time element, like depending on presentation and all that uh, for Europe or the US, or uh, are they doing anything with latitude and longitude? Not yet. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But you talked about like the international aspects. And that's, that's actually a really good reason. Like most folks are publishing one version of the website for the entire world. And the ISO date, this year, month, day, 
is the most internationally readable form of the date time. So if you have any fraction of international visitors, you should really consider using ISO dates rather than US dates or European dates, especially please avoid using two digit years. Seriously, didn't we learn that lesson like 13 years ago? Yeah, okay. I know, right? Someone said COBOL's coming back. Okay, so that's latitude launch, that's a data element. Simple stuff, it's really handy. This brings us to microformats too. All right, I already told you a little bit about microformats too, but this is the basic summary. Like it really is this simple. We're using prefix class names for the root microformat class name, and then for the properties, p dash, u dash, dt dash, and e dash, and these all have to do with not necessarily types of data, but how we parse it. So, so simple properties, URL properties, date and time properties, and embedded markup, embedded content properties. Um, the second change we made for microformats 2 is every object is just a flat set of properties. We don't have sub-properties. It's like you have an H card, and then you've got a bunch of properties of the H card, and that's it. To do hierarchy, we do nesting. So if you have an H event that has a P location, if you want to further structure that location like as an address or as a venue, like you want to say this event is Adobe, 601 Townsend, San Francisco, California, you use a nested microformat to do that. Um, finally, a single class markup for common uses, and I showed you a few examples of that, where a single class name like H card or H event or H product could be used to mark up the common cases of a person's name, name of a product that's been linked, or perhaps an image of a product that's been linked. All the documentation for microformats 2 is on microformats.org slash wiki slash microformats 2. You can check it out there. Each of the vocabularies are linked from there as well. So that's the summary. All right, let's talk about implementations. Because microformats 2 has a defined parsing model, because it's generic, we've already got numerous parsers that are being used actively now on websites. Uh, the most commonly used one is the PHP one, turns out. A lot of websites or backends are built in PHP. A lot of folks consuming microformats are now doing so with the PHP microformats 2 parser. It's excellent. Secondly, there's the JavaScript parsers. There's both parsers for browser extensions and a Node.js microformats 2 parser as well. And lastly, there's the Ruby microformats parser as well. Um, we're hoping to see a Python one. Anyone here code in Python? A few folks, a couple of folks, okay. Uh, I would actually suggest starting with the PHP one and porting it because it's the most complete, has the biggest test suite, and is, is really well done. The others are in progress as well, may incrementally improve all the time, but the development community around the PHP Microformats 2 parser is amazing, and they're doing great work. Okay, so here's, I've been talking about the Microformats as your API, you know, as, as providing the simplest, cheapest dry API. Here's a simple example. This, this web page, this is the Mozilla Web Forward um, experts or mentors web page, and we've got images and a little card for each person that's, that is a mentor. Their name, their description, their photo, all of that is also mark, marked up with microformats too. So if you look at this from a data perspective, this is what it looks like. This is the canonical JSON representation of this page by parsing it with a generic microformats 2 parser. You get a list of items, and each of those items says what type of item it is. It's, it's, in this case, it's an H card, and what properties it has, like name, URL, note, category, photo, et cetera. Perfect for consumption and doing something with in your web app. So if you have a web app that consumes a list of people and does something with it, you can use this immediately, right? And you can use it with any site that publishes information about people or lists of people. This gets, brings me to the most recent uh, like amazing development with Microformats 2 usage, especially from an ecosystem perspective of publishers and consumers. So a lot of the cases I've been talking about with microformats have been many publishers publish and then few consumers consume, like search engines, right? We don't have that many search engines. We have lots of people with websites, very few search engines. This, the indie web, however, every single website is a potential publisher and a potential consumer, and that's kind of cool. What this means is that we get things like indie websites that are publishing not just blog posts, not just notes, but replies to notes so this is Aaron Parecki's website, aaronparecki.com. He posted a small note. It looks like a tweet, right? But it's on his own site. He posted a small note as a reply to Lawrence's post on eshnu.com. And what he did 
was when he posted this, he put in his little blog post, he said, I'm replying to this reply post. His blog posting software went and parsed the original content that he's replying to, extracted out the H entry for the entire post, the H card for the poster with their photo, name, URL, took the whole thing, DT published, and incorporated it as into the context of his post. Some of you might have seen this kind of thing on Twitter, where if you at reply, you reply to a post, right? You go to, your, you go to the permalink for your at reply, what do you see? You see the original tweet above it. Okay, well this, this presentation has been adopted now by independent websites, and we're not doing this. It's all working because he's publishing microformats too, and he's consuming microformats too. Different software, uh, different solutions, both using microformats two parsers, and making it work. So let me show you the original post. This is Lawrence's original post, where he said testing, et cetera, et cetera. This is that comment that he left, right? So I'll go back. Aaron Parecki says, at Eshnu, it worked. Now here's the reply. Here's his comment. So in the same way, we got federated indie web comments working automatically through Microformats 2. Because Aaron also published his post with H entry and H card, Lawrence's original post was able to pull that in, syndicate it, copy it, and show it with his presentation. Now you'll notice there's lots of slight differences in presentation here. They look very different, but because they're based on the same data, the contents are the same. And that's pretty cool. Okay. Peer-to-peer -peer web commenting. The notification is based on a, a small protocol called Web Mention. Um, that's, based, that's, that's essentially a simplification of pingback, if anyone's curious about that particular aspect of it. But the data is all passing both directions using microformats too. Not to be content with just commenting, I mean distributed commenting, that's no big deal, right? We're all doing that? No, it's actually a huge deal, and it, it didn't start happening until April of this year. It's like three months old. It's awesome, it's exciting. Um, if you want to check out, look, at, in, look up IndieWebCamp.com if you're curious more about how that works. Um, not even a month ago, wow. Uh, we did this thing at IndieWebCamp. We've came up with the idea of, well, if we can do comments back and forth, why can't we do events as well? So this is Aaron Parecki, again, posting a reply, but an RSVP reply to an event post that's also on an Indie website. And he's posted this with a microformat for an RSVP in response to this microformat for an event. Okay, he's saying he's not attending, but again, he included the context of the event, the summary, where it was posted, all that location um, on, in his post permalink on his site. And if we look at the event post, here's the event post on Ben Wordmuller's site. And you can see that Aaron Parecki's post came through here and it said RSVP to no. Again, a difference in presentation because the semantics are, are communicated with microformats back and forth. So where does that bring us? Okay, which microformats two vocabularies can you use today? This is pretty cool. Like this is the stuff that's actually already supported with the new microformats two syntax and vocabularies, not just with classic microformats. Addresses, HADR for structured addresses, HCARD for any kind of contact information, about information, um, authors of blog posts, showed a few examples of that. H entry, every blog post should be marked up with H entry. There are already WordPress themes that do it. So if, if you have a WordPress blog, anyone have a WordPress blog? Okay, then you can immediately deploy this if you either update your, your, uh, your template, your theme, or uh, edit your theme to include those class, class names. H event for events, and then one of the key microformats that's been uh, adopted for this back and forth indie web federated commenting RSVPing system is rel in reply to. So that's how an original post can, can tell, hey, is this, is this post that's linking to me more than just a mention, more than just a pingback, is it a comment? Is it an actual reply? If it is, then it links back with, with rel equals in reply to on the hyperlink back to the original post, and that's pretty cool. So as I mentioned, for more information on how those examples of consuming and publishing microformats work, check out IndieWebCamp.com. There's the Indie, at IndieWebCamp Twitter as well. And finally, uh, if you're on IRC, on Freenode, where a lot of this development happens, there's the hashtag IndieWebCamp uh, uh, channel on Freenode. It's pretty cool. This brings me to a little more of a forward-looking point, and I want to talk about, it was forward-looking until recently, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, Mozilla officially launched Firefox OS phones, Eastern Europe, a few other countries like Spain and such, and one of the things we've been working on is 
what are the ways that we can consume data like microformats from the web and provide additional functionality to users? And this isn't launched yet. We're working on this. So like I said, it's a little forward looking. But imagine as you will, you go to a website. It's got contact information. You're on a mobile phone. You don't want to fuss with copy and pasting all that contact information in your address book. Wouldn't it be nice if the browser suggested, hey, why don't I, do you want me to add this contact to your contacts uh, application? Or do you want me to add these events to your calendar? And suggested it that way. Right? Mozilla's working on this, um, but that doesn't mean everyone, anyone else can't either. I wanted to announce this to you guys because that's giving you one more additional reason to include this kind of markup on your pages. And those are just two examples right, of really obvious use cases for contacts and events. There's many more coming. Yes, question. Right. So the question was, so in this kind of environment, the browser wouldn't need extensions to do it, but would be natively presenting these things. Yes, that's, that's the goal. We want to build in this support to the browser for the data types that make sense for the user. And two obvious ones we see are contacts and, and events. Another one that's obvious is any geo markup or any ADR markup should give you a hint, hey, here's a location. Shall I map it for you? That kind of thing, right? And that would be quite handy. On a mobile device, you don't want to do lots of keystrokes. You don't want to do lots of gestures. You want the device to anticipate what you might want to do and provide you those options. And that's one of the things we're working on. So I'm pretty excited about that too. OK, we can do Q&A now. But before I go into Q&A, I figure, why don't we do an FAQ? I get some really, uh, really frequent questions about my microformats, the first of which is, well, OK, which, fine, which microformats should I use? I've heard, I've heard all these lists. Give me an overview. I want to do all the right things for my site. And it's non-trivial, it's non but the first thing you should do is, for every page you have, use one classic microformat for whatever the main subject of that page is. And the reason is, is that that's what right now the search engines will see and detect and represent in, in rich snippets, right? Search engines don't look for multiple microformats on the page, really. What they do is they want to know, OK, how can I show you what this one page is about? It's a summary kind of thing. And so that's why you should use at least one classic microformat. Now, in addition to that, for all the data on the page, use microformats too to mark it up. That's where you're providing your API that canonical JSON output that you were seeing, that back and forth indie web consumption and production ecosystem that you're seeing. Finally, if you are building your site and you really need site-specific link previews, do you guys know what that means? Link previews, a few nodding heads. So like when you go into Facebook and type in a URL and it shows you something about that link, or on Twitter uh, when you paste the URL and it shows you like an expanded version of maybe an image or summary from that page. These are, um, the ways to do that. So for Facebook, there's the Open Graph Protocol meta tags. And for Twitter, there's the Twitter cards meta tags as well. Both of these are somewhat site specific. And therefore, you should be using them in addition to microformats, which are consumed by lots of different sites, rather than instead of. So always support the microformats for your site. And then if you need to get site specific link previews, uh, you can do so with those technologies. Now, of course, once you start doing that, once you add information to the meta tags, you have to be careful that, that your data stays consistent. So whatever source you're getting it from, whatever checks and balances you have for making sure that your data is consistent, be sure to check that your Twitter cards, your OGP, and your microformats data visible on the page are all consistent. So that's just one warning there. OK. Second question I, I get asked very often. Great, I've added my microformats, now how do I validate them? Right? How do I check to make sure that they're doing what I think that they're doing? Uh, there's a really nice interactive uh, microformats parser on pin13.net. If you go there, you can type in your URL. It'll give you the nice little clean JSON output so you can quickly see, am I getting the data that I think I'm getting from my page? It's pretty cool. Um, the other thing, the other tool you can use to see specifically what is Google doing with my microformats, there's the Google Rich Snippets testing tool. Now, it doesn't support all microformats. It just supports the ones that Google is currently interested in showing as rich snippets. But that list continually grows. So it's a good place to check as well. Finally, uh, there's the operator plugin or add-on for Firefox that has a very nice debug mode. And this is useful for local debugging. So if you've got a local HTML page you're editing and you want to see what it looks like, or you've got some HTML that's generated as, as a result of some JavaScript, uh, you can use the operator tool for Firefox, turn on debug mode, and it'll show you, OK, how, what data is it coming getting from what microformats. Lastly. I heard some questions before the presentation about like, 
how do I create a new microformat, or how do I get involved, how do I provide feedback? And there's basically you know, three different ways to do that. The first is check out, read, and edit, contribute to the microformats wiki. Someone I was speaking to earlier wanted to develop a wine microformat for marking up different varietals, different ways that people publish wine information on the web. Great. Let's start with documenting how people publish wine information. Let's see if you know, other existing wine formats we can reuse, we can leverage. We do all that kind of work on the microformats wiki. We keep it open. We keep it in the public domain for maximum reuse. Second, we have a microformats Twitter as well. And, and most, most importantly, a lot of the discussions about microformats happen on the IRC channel, on, on the Poundside microformats channel on Freenode. Question over here. So the question was, really, if you want to send uh, data to the browser, why not just use custom tags to the browser and then change that with presentation on the client side, which you can do with even CSS. Right? As of HTML5, you can pretty much use any tag name you want that's not in the spec, and it'll do something. And you can apply CSS to it. So, sorry? Or any? Angular. I don't know. Okay. I don't know what Angular is. Is a JS thing? Okay. Um, yes, you can use XML markup like that in your, in your HTML. And the problem is twofold. First, that was definitely tried. There are some limitations with using tags for markup. The biggest thing is that a tag can only have one name. I'll say that again. A tag can only have one name. A class can have multiple class names. It's super important. So if, for example, the same element contains information about the name, the URL, the photo, other attributes of, of, the, of, a, of a microformat, you can't do that with XML. You can't do that with custom tags. You have to use either class attribute or you have to use nested tags, in which case you're applying some, some odd semantic of like, well, what does it mean to have you know, one of those inside the other? Okay. It's just markup ironically doesn't work well for marking up arbitrary data. It's one of those ironies. Or tags don't won't work well. Um, the second problem is every time the solutions have been tried where it's like make up a bunch of tags and publish that stuff, you end up with everyone making up their own tags, you end up with the Tower of Babel problem. And the whole point of communicating things with microformats is interoperability. And so you have to agree on what the names are. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a pretty involved process for going through and saying, hey, now that we've figured out, here are the concepts for a new microformat, how do we name these and how do we come to an agreement of names so that when we're talking about the same thing, we know we are talking about the same thing. So that's a pretty big challenge. Um, there might be other ways to use XML. I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's a great way to experiment. But I haven't found a lot of folks actually mixing XML and HTML5 and making it work. Has anyone here done that? like deployed systems that use it. I mean, I'd be interested in learning about it because I'm always looking to hear about alternatives and, and trying to figure out like, you know, what's, what's going on, like what advantages do those alternatives bring um, or disadvantages, et cetera. All right. Thank you for your time. Happy to present here. I'm going to now go over to the Etherpad to see what kind of other questions we've got. Who is consuming microformats 2 in the wild yet? Moles, yes. I'm guessing that might be from Twitter. <laughs> OK. Let's see. The biggest consumers of microformats 2 right now are, uh, I believe, Spinner is consuming them. I need to double check with them. Last time I talked to Kevin Burton, uh, he said they were consuming it all. So I'm like, OK, that sounds good. And every single indie website that's deployed, which is probably only about like a dozen or so, that are actually consuming them actively right now. Um, but everyone that's, that's uh, there's a WordPress plugin, so everyone that installs that WordPress plugin to get those indie web comments to work is consuming microformats too. And again, that's one use case, but it's one of those things that I, I'm going to expect to see taking off quite rapidly. Uh, one of the things we saw late last year is, is that Google started parsing HAtom. Um, we didn't see any announcement from them saying, hey, we're parsing HAtom now. But they did. They started parsing HAtom. And 
they started having it show up not just in the Google uh, Webmaster dashboard, but also in their rich snippets tester. Now, I don't know how that changes the display of Google results, but they started publishing it. I mean, sorry, they started consuming it and parsing it just because there's so much out there, right? Um, namely, if you look at WordPress blogs, the default themes have included HAdam for a couple of years now, at least. So it makes sense for them to do so. I figure there's probably like some sort of threshold where if there's a certain amount of some markup published in the web, Google will try to do something intelligent with it. And they're probably constantly running queries, running analysis on like what kind of markup is taking off or not taking off. And if it, it crosses some threshold, they say, well, can we do something useful with it? Um, they're usually fairly practical about that kind of thing. So that's, that's one question. Do we only have one question? Any other questions? And I think we have a microphone as well. Yes, here in the front row. One comment following up on the XML versus the class names thing. Um, you know, I don't know how long ago, let's go maybe five, six years ago, jQuery became uh, popular. And um, it, it would probably be, I'm, I'm glad there's a JavaScript parser for these microformats, but it would be mindlessly simple to do it with something like jQuery. And so I think these things dovetail. It's just a kind of a comment. And I don't know if you have any uh, uh, response to that. You know, that tools like jQuery make it very easy to parse out things. Yeah. And if you come up with these very, very consistent standards like this that are flexible, where you can have things like multiple class names and all that, I think it becomes very easy. It's just kind of a comment that, you know, I've done all sorts of crazy stuff with XML and HTML. And, and again, I think I've run into a lot of the things that you have. Cool. Yeah, I think that's true. Like the more the more libraries that we can publish in open source for this stuff, especially with JavaScript, it seems like JavaScript has taken off and is becoming the dominant way to do things, whether on the client or on the server with uh, 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 with Node, right? There's even like what script.google.com where you can run hosted JavaScripts as well on the server. They've got their own server environment for where you can do that. Cool stuff. Yes. Over here. One second, let's get to the microphone. So why aren't there 300 micro formats out there now that we're all consuming and publishing already? I mean, I'm, I'm new to this particular topic. The short answer is vocabularies are hard. Yeah, but they're not that hard. I mean, a lot, they're, of they're other, pretty hard. a lot of other standards have come and risen in the last X many years. Why is this one not taken off? Even for something specific like, like wine, for, for music markup, for some things like that. Music markup has been a tough one, actually, believe it or not. And there's, 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 a, lot of, there's a lot of forces at play there. Um, there was an H-Audio microformat that was developed. And I think as part of that experience, we, we learned how, how microformats should be developed and shouldn't be developed. And it really taught us that one of the things, one of the lessons we learned from that is that email lists just don't work for, for, uh, for standards development, um, for vocabularies. You end up with a disproportionate um, Amount of, amount of contribution or main email from like one person versus who can actually read all the email. And that's why we've switched to an IRC, IRC and wiki uh, based model there. But it turns out there's, for a lot of these types of content, there's just not that much of it or not that much that people want to research and document on the web. Um, it's easy to make up 300 microformats. You'd be like, hey, I know how to publish this information. I'll just make up a microformat for the fields of it. What's harder is to actually follow a scientific process of, wait, let's look at what information is actually published today. Because if people don't have the incentive to publish information currently, a microformat for it isn't going to really change that information, so you're not going to get adoption. And that's, that's the key. Um, the second piece is that we try really hard to leverage existing standards for data formats. So for example, you know, one, of the, one of the popular ones that comes up is genealogy. There's a popular uh, genealogy standard called, called GEDCOM. It's not an HTML standard, but it's, it is a standard for uh, exchanging that kind of information. And people even tried marking that up with microformats, but there just hasn't been that much uptake of it. Right? So there's lots of different types of data out there that could be marked up. Um, the, key step, the key part of that is in order to make it useful to get adoption, there has to be research and be like, hey, how are people publishing this data? Are there existing standards we can leverage? Can we combine those two pieces of information? What are people publishing? What existing vocabularies are there? And then create a microformat. And that's just hard enough that we've only got about a dozen, like I said, different successful microformats. And by successful, I mean both widely deployed, being published, and being consumed. 
right? There's, there's many more that are being published. And that's, um, that's, use, that's interesting, but it's not as useful as, as formats that are published and consumed. Yes, question. Oh, back there first. OK, sorry, microphone gets to pick. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think you might have answered my question, but following to the previous question is, uh, in my experience with the microformats and a lot of formats like DTDs and things from XML, it's, um, it's, it, it's very, very challenging to get a community to um, come to an agreement yep. on that format. And you were talking about that for, for microformats. And that's one of the things that sort of, you know, uh, that I'm interested in is what is, and maybe you've answered this, you know, what is the one thing that the community could community could do to drive adoption of a specific uh, microformat? So what's, what's the one thing a community can do to, uh, to drive adoption of a specific microformat? Uh, I would say to keep the microformat as simple as possible. So a, a, lot of, a lot of standards design, there's a temptation to include as much as possible into the standard. And the thing we've seen with microformats, the ones that have taken off are the ones that are the simplest and that uh, that, that are the most useful. So even if you think, hey, I want to add 20 different fields to this microformat because I, I'm pretty sure they're all going to be useful, you know, cut that number in half. Add what you think are the 10 most popular fields, the 10 most types of information about some object that are being published today. Get experience with how are people publishing that, and then where does it fall short? And that's what we tell people. Most people that come to microformats will be like, hey, I have a great idea for a new microformat. We're like, great. What existing microformats are you using today? And they're usually like, well, none of them. We're like, OK, get some experience. If you want to learn how to create a new microformat that, that will get adopted, you need to yourself feel, like, get the experience of using a microformat to figure out, OK, what's easy about using microformats and what's harder so that you can develop a good microformat for consumption. Does that help answer your question? OK, cool. Well, again. So it's, a, it's a very tough question. I mean, that's, adoption is, is a huge challenge. For anything. Uh, yes. Most of the existing formats that have gotten hammered into Unity have had to go through some sort of pipe, such as a small browser community, mobile devices, databases. I mean, you don't have a huge amount of SQL variation, mainly because there's been SQL engines that have consumed it, whereas microformat's main consumer is their own web page. So you don't really have the same sort of pipe forcing Unity on a microformat that you do a true format, I mean, not, not to be mean, but a true format like XML or SQL. So the question was, I think, you don't have as much uh, uniformity pushing for a microformat. One of the things that you get with the generic uh, syntax of microformats too, I'm going to go back to the summary page here the prefix class names, the generic syntax, is that anyone can start publishing class names with these, uh, with these prefixes, and they'll automatically get parsed using the existing parsers. So we have a convention saying, hey, if you want to create your own data markup for a page, you can actually put h dash, and then we've said, okay, use a, use a prefix inside that, like h, h dash, x dash, whatever you want, to start creating new data objects, new properties. Um, if you have a specific community that's got their own vocabulary, like there's the activity stream standard. And how many of you are familiar with activity streams? Extension to Adam, a few folks, okay. Um, some of us on the indie web are publishing h-as-dash microformats in addition to the common vocabularies for exactly that reason. We're like, hey, we don't know if these are gonna work as like common microformats, but let's start experimenting with extensions with microformats for the page that'll work really well. Um, for common microformats, one of the things you might have noticed with a lot of these, a lot of, you know, which microformats should I use? HADR, all the vocabulary of HADR is from the vCard standard. We didn't make up any of it. HCard is all based on, H-card is all based on vCard 4. Again, the vocabulary was created somewhere else. We took it, we took the subset that it seemed was useful for the web, and we said, let's just use it as is. Right? Invent as little as possible. Reuse the hard work that other people have done before you. Um, H entry largely reuses Atom semantics. Almost always you reuse the terms from Atom as well. Um, H event is straight from iCalendar. So those are familiar with that standard. 
And that's, that's one of the ways we've been able to let, get so much progress with microformats is that we've been, we try to be as disciplined as we can and as, as almost conservative with inventing new vocabulary. Um, well, in reply to is a new thing. And some of those vocabularies I showed you early on, like H review, there was no good review standard. There was a few attempts at, the, at some, but nothing had taken off. So that was a lot of work to come up with the vocabulary, like a minimal vocabulary for a review. Um, it definitely is a challenge. And I, I think that there's a lot of room for experimentation, especially now that we have the generic syntax. Question over here. Yeah. Hi, Tantec. Is that Kevin? It's Kevin, yes. Oh, hey. Go for um, it. You didn't mention rel tag. I thought you thought you might want to comment on that as well. Uh, you didn't, I didn't mention rel tag. Yes. Um, well, Kevin and I worked together co-founding, co-creating microformats and at Technorati as well, where we helped develop this microformat called rel tag. How many of you are familiar with rel equals tag? A few folks here, there. OK. And for as long as Technorati was a blog search engine, we parsed rel tags within blog posts on pages and applied them uh, to the post, not to the whole page. And the rel, the, the rel tag uh, value was an exception in that regard. Almost all rel values, and at this point now, according to the HTML5 standard, all rel values apply to the whole page, from the page they're on to the page they're linking to. And rel tag was an exception to that. Um, we supported that, and then another service called, when I say we, sorry, Technorati supported that back then, and IceRocket, uh, another blog search engine, supported that. Now, as far as I can tell, neither, neither of those are actually blog search engines anymore. Or if they are, they search a very small number of blogs, and they no longer use their previous code bases. So uh, despite we coming out with rel tag, despite coming out with multiple implementations for it, it's a microformat that got published and now lingers on in pages, but there's no one really consuming it, as far as we know. I mean, unless you know of someone, Kevin. Yeah, we were using it. We were using rel tag as part of reviews. One of the one of the feedback we got was that it's too complicated. Like, when do I use a rel versus a property and all that? So we made everything properties, right? So we said, okay, p dash category. There's your there's the way to like tag things right now. Simple text, and that's. That's kind of where that's ended up. Well, Back there. Um, two questions. One, when do you think the H product standard will be ready for microformats 2.0? And what's the best way to tag hidden data or data you don't want to specifically show on the page? Maybe because it's, it's displayed in a way that would not be picked up by microformats? First things first. You said products, right? Yeah. Correct. Let's see if this is there. I thought maybe it was. So if you if you go to microformats.org slash wiki slash h dash product, you will see a full example and list of vocabulary for publishing H product information in microformats too. So that should answer the first question. Second question, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I'm on like really short memory right now because I flew from, uh, flew ten, 10 time zones yesterday. Well, it's ready to publish. The question is, it wasn't listed on, on one of the formats ready to use today. The formats I listed, switch tabs, and there we go. These are all being consumed today as well. Okay, you can publish any of the Microformats 2 vocabularies immediately. We've got all those spec'd out for publishing right away. And those work with existing parsers. So, no, as far as we know, no one in the wild is yet parsing Microformats 2 H product. That's right. Um, what's that? Google Shop? We don't know. We do know they are parsing the classic Microformat H product. So. At least what you should do, like per that advice of like, you know, which, um, let's see, there we go. Uh, if on pages that represent a single product, you should still use H product so that it gets picked up by the search engines. But there's no harm in also adding the microformats 2 markup for it so that any microformats 2 parsers that come along will support it as well. And since the parsers for microformats 2 
are now more actively developed and being used by sites that consume microformats, we expect to see the growth there rather than the classic ones. Oh, that was the last question, right? What's the, what's the good way to market hidden data? I haven't found it yet. Um, what's the use case? So, th so the question really is about what do you do with information that you have to present like once globally to a search engine versus information that you don't have to present to the user, to, the, to a user of a website who has already said, hey, I'm in this country or this state, mm -hmm. or I've chosen this color, or, or, or this availability. Correct. It's a good question. Um, I think clearly for the for the crawler case, you need to mark it all up and, and put it all on the page, right? Yeah. So if a user were to come to that page directly, like let's say they search for the product on Google, and it was because it's crawled, it comes up in the search results. They click on that, they come to your site for the first time. They're immediately prompted with what market they're in, Even what state if they're in. Before they see the page. That yeah, was and then the page reloads and it shows what page reloads. If whether or not the product's in stock or out of stock. Is there some affordance on that page to change what market they're in? There is. It's a little drop down in the, in the top menu. But my guess is it probably still shows their current state, right? We try to guess based on their IP, but we still prompt them to confirm that that's the state they're in. Right, but once you've prompted them and they've said, okay, that little drop down probably shows their current state. Correct. Right? So it's still visible. Yes. So you, so you could mark it up there. Could. That's true. But we want just when the crawler hits the page, we only we don't have that logic going for the crawlers. Right. It's just just it defaults to California because that's where our main warehouse is. That's cool. Yeah. I think in either one of those cases you can mark it up. Either it's part of the the UI for the drop down, or it's part of the page. Would you ever use like hidden inputs or meta tags? Somewhere? I would try to avoid those because those tend to get out of sync. Anything that you hide from the user mm -hmm. tends to get out of sync. That's okay. been that's been our experience over time. Um, you know, meta keywords is sort of like the classic example of that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Maybe one more question. Oh, well, we got one in the back there, someone who hasn't asked yet, so let's. Hi, I had a, a couple of questions, maybe really basic ones. Um, so you showed a slide, uh, I think you were recommending to use classic uh, microformats in the body. Yes. So is, the, is microdata considered a classic microformat? It's not. Okay. Microdata is another way Another syntax for marking up items um, on uh, microformat on an HTML, and that's uh, let's see if I can go to that slide. By the way, this entire presentation is on the web. It's all built in HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. So, any of you presenting out there, this is the SF HTML5 group. I want to strongly encourage you to also do your presentations in HTML5, <laughs> right? We should be able to eat our own dog food. Yes? Yay. That didn't sound very encouraging. Yes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> HTML5. It works for presentations. OK. So with microdata, you have to actually use, um, and I'm not going to go through a whole example, but there's about five different attributes you need to use to mark that up. Uh, you can use similar vocabularies as microformats, but the syntax is much bigger to do so, and you have to figure out which attributes to use for what purpose and all that as well. Um, so in our experience, most web developers have preferred to use microformats because it's just easier. It's less work. Okay, so if, if I just started learning microdata and went through the trouble of adding all this microdata markup to my site, and now I want to start adding the microformats too, is it recommended to just replace it with the microformats too, or just leave both together? So that's, that's kind of your choice. If you've already got microdata you're working on your site, it's less work to just leave it, right? Um, you can add microformats too in addition to what you, the work you've already done, and that should work just fine. And does that help? It gives you that API that I was uh, talking about. I see. Yeah, okay. so it definitely helps there. The other thing is that we go back to that question.
on some search engines, it may give you that you know, main subject kind of functionality. So what you can do is, since you've gone to the effort of, of putting in microdata, you can leave it there. You can, you can still add the classic microformat on body as well, and then add microformats to for your, for your uh, JSON data support for all the data on your web page. Yeah. It should be a lot less work than it was to add the microdata, like a fraction of the work. Yeah. If it's not, get online and, and ask. No problem. And that was the last question, right? It was. We're a real quick question? Yeah. Okay. Um, real quick question. Okay. What is the actual syntax for the classic marker format on the body tag? Like, what would the code actually look like for marking the What's subject? the actual syntax for marking this? So, the, you can just use the class attribute on the body tag. Right. How do you indicate the subject? The subject is the root class name. So if the page is about a person, you would say class equals V card, which is the root class name for an H card. If the subject is an event, you say class equals V event. The classic, if the subject is a product, class equals H product, H review, et cetera. So whatever, whatever is the subject is the main, is the main microformat that you use there. And there were, there was a extension here. So here's an example of a complete geo microformat, right? So you can imagine if a page is just about a single latitude, latitude longitude point, you could put body class equals geo at the top level. That's an example. All right, I'm going to leave these slides. The URL to the slides is up here. Uh, it's just, it's, I'll read it out loud for the presentation as well. Tontech.com slash presentations slash 2013 slash 07 slash microformats2. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>